Hey, it's uh, Keith St. John here. Uh, this is going to be my first video. I've been doing a bunch of permaculture stuff on my homestead here. I'm in Southern Ontario Zone 4-5. Uh, today I'm going to teach you how to make biochar, which is a 1,000 to 2,000 year soil amendment. Um, essentially, what you do is you get an oil drum and you cut a hole in it and then you have a fire without oxygen. And I'll show you how to do that. Uh, and then you have to inoculate it, so you have to put it into compost system. So I'm going to show you my compost system here behind me. I run them on swales. So swales are ditches and trenches on contour. Uh, the biological life in the compost is going to decompose and uh, fill the battery that is the biochar. And that's going to sit inside the soil and it's going to amend the soil for thousand two thousand years so that's how you build a legacy is you change you change the soil in your system for generations to come after you're long gone so what I'm walking through now is just the upper area of my uh, food forest system you can see it down here I, I've done some updates on reddit uh, all this stuff is wood chips two to three hundred trees and bushes biochar leaves, compost, horse manure, and I'm going to show you how to do it. I learned all this stuff in the last maybe four years or so, uh, so if I can do it, you can do it. So here we are, uh, here's a brush pile, one of about seven or eight that I have on my property. This is all from the sumac cuttings and things that I haven't used uh, for trellises of the main garden. So here's, you know, just a small little market garden that I created when I started this project, uh, all the trellises are the larger pieces of the sumac and the smaller pieces of the sumac were put into brush piles both for wildlife habitat uh, and then it eventually to turn into charcoal and then inoculate it with organic life and material which will be the biochar. So what you need to do is you need to have a a fire within the absence of oxygen. So you cut the top of one of these, there's many ways to do it, this is just one. I found this is the fastest and easiest way, is you cut the top off one of these oil drums, and then you have the fire inside that, starting it from the corner, and then building it up. And I'll explain it as I go. You essentially want to have the fire, the combustion area, at the top of the burn, and you want to have a non-combusted wood underneath it where the, the gases will get driven out from the heat of the fire and then will rise up because there's nowhere to go and they'll burn and recombust in the burn area. What this does is it creates a very clean fire and it leaves a lot of the charcoal which is the cell walls of the organic matter uh, perfectly in place and uh, intact that will be the nucleation sites and the bonding sites for all the nutrient and that's what the biochar that's the strength of the biochar so again sorry for the shaky video it's freezing out here my hands are cold and I'm trying to make my first video this they'll get better I hope okay thank you what you're gonna want to do is pre soak the area around where you're going to have your compost biochar fire and then you want to have a source of of water so you can always quench it if you ever need to and you want to obviously have no trees uh, up and above it just in case the fire does go fast at the beginning the fire is going to be largely combustion with a bunch of oxygen uh, turning charcoal into ash wood into charcoal and then charcoal into ash you're going to want to drive that into an oxygen depleted environment as soon as possible and we're going to do that two ways we're going to fill this thing as densely as we can. So I'm going to stitch in a bunch of smaller twigs into this. The ideal size for the start is anything around uh, maybe uh, two, three, four inches wide. Anything thicker than that, you might have to run it through two processes. The bottom of my tub right now is full of stuff that wasn't quite finished from the last time I did this. And then after that, uh, you want to have something, you know, about the size of a pinky finger to an index or middle finger uh, in diameter. Nothing too much bigger than that. It's better. The smaller stuff has more green ramule growth when it, it'll dry out faster. It'll combust and burn hotter and it'll drive more heat out faster. 
Uh, so that's really what you want to focus on twigs. Use the bigger stuff for firewood, uh, for building posts, and then use the small stuff for charcoal. That's the best way to do it. As this thing burns and gets brittle, we're going to use a tamper. So you can see the tamper back here. We're going to use the tamper to smash it down and get the charcoal right on the bottom so that we can keep filling this up and, uh, and get it to be as oxygen depleted as possible. Okay, so what we've done now is we've got the fire started in a corner. Um, I started it in this corner here. It's caught on a bit. As it, once it gets its foothold established, which you can really tell by feeling the barrel, and you can feel around the side, you know, what the temperature profile across it is. When it starts getting a little further away, you know that that big, uh, heavy steel barrel has sucked up a lot of the heat. And you can tell also by the, the, the rocks around the bottom, if you touch them, you can kind of tell how much heat they have stored. Once you feel like you've got a decent amount of heat in the area, you can start stamping down with the tamper and get some of those charcoals, the coals, to fall down to the bottom. They'll keep some heat on the bottom and really start to drive the pyrolysis and the bottom wood and the gases up through the burn zone. And what you also find is when you stamp the corner, the fire will start to creep across the top to the other side. So we'll uh, let her go for a bit and we'll check back in in a little while. Okay, we're about uh, 30 minutes in, 40 minutes into the burn. I just wanted to show you guys, once you get this going, look how clean the burn is. There's almost no smoke. You know, all the stuff at the top, there's going to be a little bit of smoke from... Right now, I, I don't have the burn coming quite all, quite all the way across. Uh, so the stuff over here on this side is going to be uh, combustion. But if you look at the heat, and I don't know, you can't feel the heat coming off this thing, but there is a lot of heat coming off this. What's going on right now is the gases from the wood at the bottom are being pyrolyzed and sent up. They're being pushed out of the wood, and they're entering this burn zone at the top. And the burn is really, really clean, lots and lots of energy and heat coming off this thing, which is going to further drive the process. So I'm going to tamp this down now. Hopefully I can figure out a way to do this one-handed with a lot of heat in there. I'm going to tamp this down and show you guys essentially what you're trying to do. So some of the coal, that wasn't great, but some of the coal is going to fall to the bottom. I'm going to reload the top with more pyro or combustion wood. And as it burns, and uh, it does a little bit of combustion, but pyrolysis from the bottom, again, the gas is re-burning re in the combustion layer. I'm going to keep tamping it down, and this thing is going to slowly fill bottom up with, with coals that are 100% uh, cell wall, well, maybe not 100%, but... Uh, cell walls intact, long carbon chains. The long carbon chains of the cell wall act as activation sites for holding and storing nutrient and water, and also uh, little hallways and crevices, microscopic, for the soil microbiology to set foothold in and uh, really have a safe place to multiply and colonize. And it's the life in your soil that is going to feed the roots of the plants. So all gardening is about finding ways to increase the life in the soil, and this is one of the best ways possible. Okay, I refilled it back up, and I'm showing you a smoky fire for a reason. I think it's really important that we don't just show people the good things we're doing. We show people the mistakes that we're doing. My mistake today is that it actually rained a few times in the last week or two, and what that's done is it's put a little bit more uh, moisture and wetness in the wood than I'd like. So when I tamp it down and get those coals to the bottom, uh, when I refill it with the new wood, it's wetter than I'd like. A lot of this smoke you're seeing is steam. Um, however, because water and steam absorb so much heat, the burn area gets very much colder than it should be in order to recombust the gases. So when you're putting wet wood on top, 
what you have happen is those combustion gases that you're seeing here, um, they're coming up through the burn zone and it's not hot enough to recombust them. So a real important thing, oh, I'm getting smoked in here. So a real important thing when you're doing these fires is to use as dry wood as possible. The stuff that I'm using seasoned for about a year, but because it was a little wet, the top layer is very wet. It's sucking a lot of heat out and you can see the amount of uh, gases that I'm normally reburning. But for right now, until that moisture gets sucked out of this new stuff, uh, the gases are getting out. My goal here for the next little while, short while, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to go around and collect some really, really, really dry cedar and I'm going to put it on top. That'll hopefully get um, a hot burn area, especially small twiggy cedar. That'll get a hot burn area back on top. Uh, this pawpaw area is planted out to uh, rose bushes, uh, so pawpaws and then rose bushes just outside of it and gar uh, onion and dill and garlic outside of that and then um, perennial kale and clover outside of that and Jerusalem out artichokes outside of that. So what that essentially does is the deer, I get a lot of deer pressure coming in from this way and bunnies. So what that does is it gives the deer and bunnies something that they like to eat. They eat that stuff and then they hit that smell wall of the onion and garlic and the dill and asparagus and they don't like to come in any closer than that. And then they hit the thorn wall of sea berries, uh, roses, autumn olives and they don't really push any further in and that gives them, they basically come in, they eat what they like, they hit the smell wall, they fertilize my land while they're there and I get to see bunnies and deers all the time and I don't really care because they're not eating the stuff that I actually want. So here's the, the cedar forest. Uh, this is a, a lower area of my land. It's fairly useless uh, in terms of food. There's a, a deer come in from the, uh, from the river and the stream here. And um, the way that cedar basically work is as they grow up and the lower branches don't get enough sun, the tree uh, closes off the water supply to those branches and uh, they slowly die off and dry out. So anyone who's walked around a cedar uh, forest, you know that it's just full of this kind of stuff here. Just easy, easy to break, uh, dead, completely dry, as dry as it can get uh, branches. So I'm going to collect a bunch of these and stick them on the fire. I'm going to go quick because actually I'm going to go take a look at the fire first and then I'm going to go do this. Um, keep an eye on your fire. Okay, checking back in. I just want to show you guys we're clean again. Yay, it worked. And I've got a bunch more. Uh, where we go? Right there, a bunch more in case I need it. I got 100 times uh, more than that if I need it, uh, if, if it gets out of control again. I'm going to really focus on keeping the top layer as dry as possible, mixing in some of the other dry stuff so that we don't get a bunch of water vapor having to come out of. Uh, out of the wood and really pulling that heat out of the fire. I want it really hot on top and I want to reburn those gases. Uh, we're about two hours in now. I just wanted to give an update uh, and just some general tips. Right now uh, you'll probably see a lot of ash, a lot more ash than I typically like. It's a balance, it's a, it, it, it's a process that has a, uh, a tipping point between the fire going out and the heat being removed off the top and then making a, a bunch of combustion gases that don't get reburned, or a hot air on top that is uh, sometimes consuming a little bit of charcoal, a little bit of the coal to produce ash, um, but that's a lot of heat as well. So what I like to do is I like to typically err on the side of too much ash. The ash is a great soil amendment itself. Uh, and it will actually kind of balance the pH a little bit with the charcoal. Uh, especially for me, I have a fairly acidic soil. Well, not it's not that bad. It's uh, about 6.5 or, or something like that. So it's, you know, it's not a 4 or anything like that. Um, but the ash will actually kind of raise the pH up to around 6.5, 6.6, 6.7. Uh, 
Um, so I don't mind a little bit of ash in there, uh, consuming some of my charcoal. What I really don't want is a dirty burn. So what I really don't want is to produce a bunch of pollution while I'm trying to rehabilitate uh, my land uh, and create a legacy on my property of fertility. I don't want to offset that by putting a bunch of gas in the air. So right now we're a little bit heavy on the ash side, um, but I like it a little bit heavier on the ash side. So I'm going to stomp it down again. And I'll kind of show you guys. Stomping it down. Okay, so we're, we're pretty heavy here on the charcoal on the top. Then what I like to do is I like to get a stick and kind of dig in and lift some of the other stuff. I'm sorry, the camera's all over the place. Lift some of the, the bigger stuff that hasn't broken yet or, or burned yet up to the top. And then I'll re this down. I'll re this back down. Get that charcoal down to the bottom and I'll put some more on top. Okay, and I'll check back with you in a little bit. Sorry for the shaky video. I'm trying my best. Okay, so it's getting late, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna head uh, down to the pond. We're gonna get some water. The best thing that you can do to quench a biochar fire is actually with nutrient-rich water. So I could fill it up with a bunch of normal water, but actually, what I want to do is I want to go to my artesian well overflow. This is a a hand dug pond that I did uh, last year and um, we're going to take advantage of some of the of the uh, nutrient collection here we have frogs everywhere not so much now but uh, um, we have frogs everywhere in here I stocked it with fish there's some turtles in there uh, and there's a constant stream of water coming from the artesian well feeding this thing so this will actually stay I'm unfrozen all winter through minus 40 Celsius. It's a real gift to have this constant stream of water. I'm going to use this nutrient rich water to fill and quench the biochar and uh, we'll start the inoculation process right on day one. Uh, biochar is essentially like an empty battery and you have to charge it up. If you just put it into the soil of your gardens, it's going to charge itself on the nutrients in your soil. So you actually have to charge it up in a compost pile, urinating on it. Uh, you can put flour um, and sugar and molasses, uh, compost, manure, whatever you want in it, but it has to sit there and charge up. And then you put that into your soil and that is gonna act like a buffer, a nutrient storage that's gonna uh, slowly over time, if there's deficiencies in the soil, the soil microbiology that's living in your biochar will help take care of it. So for now, we're gonna focus on this uh, nutrient rich, high nitrate, um, fish, frog, a little bit of turtles and a snapper turtle uh, pond with a um, high iron content, uh, typical granite soaked up lime heavy uh, nutrient rich water. That's perfect. Okay, here we go. So we're going to go ahead and quench this thing now. Uh, look how clean that burn is. It's perfect. That's beautiful. This is what you want. Uh, no smoke, minimal 
minimal smoke, uh, water vapor, it's just heat driving the gases out and that recombusting, that heat redriving more gases out, it's perfect. Now I can let this go for longer, I, I nailed most of this pile here, um, I have another pile here, I have another pile uh, over here, and another couple up there. I'm uh, sheet uh, killing some poison ivy here, this is the way you do it organically, you don't need to spray chemicals, you just need to smother it. These other piles, uh, first off I don't have time, I have to go to my kids hockey game, I love my kids hockey games by the way, it's, that's, I said gardening was life, watching your kids play hockey, that's life. Uh, these other piles, I'm going to leave them for the winter as habitat uh, for bunnies and squirrels and whatever wants to live in there, give them a safe place to live and hide from predators. I'm really big on the wildlife, it's, I mean why, why bother gardening if you're all alone out here? There's no point. So I'm going to leave those ones uh, in the winter time. Let something live in it in the spring. I'll come do this again, just in time to inoculate everything. Uh, I'll probably put that in the compost. Uh, this thing here, I'm going to flood it right to the top. I'm going to let it sit in there. Uh, it's really important to flood this thing. When you put out a fire at a campfire, you don't just pour water on it and walk away. You pour water on it. You stir it and make a slurry and then you pour more water on top, you stir it again, you make sure that it's sitting in water, and then you can go. Campfires, or uh, forest fires happen all the time for, from people who don't understand how to put out a fire. You have to slurry it, you have to cover it, water holds a, a tremendous amount of heat, you have to take advantage of that and flood it. So I'm going to flood this thing full. As I said in the last uh, little clip, I'm using pond water, you can use whatever you want. I just like, while I'm flooding it, I might as well start inoculating it. Might as well. So I'm going to flood this thing full. It's going to sit like that all night. In the, uh, in the morning or, you know, it's, I'm back to work tomorrow, but uh, I'll find a time sometime in the next week. Put that up in the compost pile. I'm going to have a video up, uh, hopefully soon, on how I run my compost pile on top of swales. So I'm going to have that up there. This is going to get mixed into there, it'll sit in there all winter for a lot of the spring and then I'll put it in, uh, incorporate it into the soil then. Right now the compost that's up there, it's already full of biochar. Everything around here is already full of biochar. So this is mostly for new beds. The swales in the backyard, I don't know if, I, if you've seen the videos of my backyard tour. The swales in the backyard, they don't have any biochar yet, I don't believe. Um, so I'm going to put biochar in that, that's where this stuff will end up. Actually, that's where the other stuff will go, this stuff will probably go in new beds. Always expanding. So I'm going to flood this now, um, that'll probably be it for today, i got to run off to hockey. Um, and hopefully I'll catch up with you. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, I uh, hope it taught you something about how to make biochar, how to amend your soil, and how to build a legacy on your land where long after you pass on, the people who are using your land are going to have fertile, healthy soil to grow healthy, uh, nutritious, nutrient-rich uh, food. And also, while you're there, it's going to absorb water from the rains, nutrient from the rains, no fertilizer needed, no watering needed, hardly any, depending on your climate. You know, design smart systems, do it right, uh, and then just be a lazy gardener, walk around and harvest and forage off your land. That's that's the plan. I'm about three years into this now. Um, we'll see how it works out. Most of my trees are still young. I'm going to have a lot of learning to do. And hopefully you guys will uh, come with me as I make mistakes and learn from my mistakes. Um, and maybe I can teach you a thing or two. And maybe watching myself teach you guys, I'll learn a thing or two myself. It's always teaching the thing where sometimes you learn uh, something that you didn't know before. So. All the best, learn something new every single day, never stop learning, see you later.